Next up on the number one tee. All right, so then let's dive into the driver. Distance, fairways hit, what do you have for us? So uh, for women uh, in our coast, the median distance with driver uh, is 170 yards. Um, right. And 18% of women in Arcos um, have a median distance with driver of 200 yards or more. So about, about one in five golfers, roughly. You know, it's interesting. Fairways hit is, is really close to the same, no matter the skill level. Um, and it's a, for women, it's about 52% roughly somewhere in there. It's going to go up to maybe 54%, depending on the skill level that I, I look at or down to 50%. So there really isn't a huge discrepancy in skill level. You know, you'll have 25 handicaps that are hitting about the same fairways as a scratch player. Yeah. Um, so hitting fairways it's something that i talk about a lot is not all that important that's not the difference maker uh, the most important thing off the tee is number one keeping the ball in play so limiting penalty strokes hitting it ob hitting it into hazards that is by far the most important thing off the tee and then after you you are hitting the ball consistently enough where you're keeping it out of trouble uh, then you want to you want to get longer. You want to add length because uh, that is extremely important. Very very strong relationship between what your handicap is and how far you hit the golf ball. Um, and you will see lower handicap players hit it farther, higher handicap players hit it shorter. Uh, very strong relationship. So I would encourage everybody out there to look into uh, you know all of the speed training devices and programs that are out there to help you get longer because that will make a huge impact on your scores. So genuinely, what do you find a more important stat, fairways hit or greens hit? A greens hit is absolutely the, you know, if, if I were going to track stats and not use strokes gained. So you, if you, if you're trying, if you're really driven to get better and understand your performance, um, strokes gained is without a doubt, the, the only thing you should really be focused on. And so just a little background on strokes gained. It was created uh, 15 ish years ago by Dr. Mark Brody, a professor at Columbia. He worked with the PGA tour, came up with a, a way to analyze performance. And they first rolled it out on the PGA tour, I think in 2011 with putting, and then they expanded it to the rest of the game. So understanding your strokes gained is the best way to truly understand your performance. Um, and the stat I would have somebody look at if they weren't going to use something that gave them strokes gain would be how many greens in regulation you're hitting. There is a very strong relationship between your skill level and how many greens you hit. Um, and trying to continue to hit more greens, um, is going to drop your skill level. If you can hit a few more greens per round, your scores are going to get a lot better. Um, and it, and that just, it's pretty easy to you know understand that one. Um, every time you miss a green, you know, for most amateur players, it's anywhere from, you know, 2.6 to 2.9 shots to get the ball in the hole. And every time you hit a green, you know, even if you're not a great putter and you're averaging 2.1 putts every time you hit a green, you know, 2.8 versus 2.1. That's a big difference when you do it a few times around. Typically, you know, the rule is you want to hit the ball as far as you can, as often as you can, making sure you're taking into account penalty strokes and, you know, other, other hazards. Um, so you, you know, laying up to your favorite number it, for most people, I will, I will say that there are, are some people that, you know, sometimes have, uh, maybe a bit of the chipping yips and they're trying to avoid They have, they have a whole host of other problems going on, but <laughs> that's a whole most, other episode. <laughs> that's a, that is a, that's three episodes. Um, so for most people, you want to advance the ball as far as you possibly can, um, over the long term, that's going to lower your scoring average. And one of the, you know, one of the ways I think that's important to think of this is, is thinking of your game and optimizing your game as a range of outcomes where, you know, you may decide to go for it on a par five or, you know, a, a reachable par four, you might decide to go for it and it might end up in a bad spot for you just because that one outcome did not go the way you like 
doesn't mean that that isn't the correct play. So mm-hmm. if I were to take a quarter and flip a quarter eight times or 10 times right now, and heads came up eight times, nobody would think that you know going forward, heads is 80% likely. It, it's not. It's it, it was a short run of only 10 flips. So just about anything can happen. But I, if I flip that 10,000 times, there's no way heads is going to come up 8,000 times. It's just not possible. Mm-hmm. So you, um, if you make a decision and it's the optimal decision to um, lower your scores as much as you can, and it doesn't work out for you that time, that doesn't mean you should abandon it um, and not do it because it didn't work out that one time. It's important to think of you know, the longer term and a range of outcomes. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. And um, is there any data that backs up because you brought up the bunkers? Is a fairway bunker more detrimental than a greenside bunker, or are they both the same? Is avoiding a fairway one more, you know, is there one that's worse than the other? Yeah, you know, they're they're both for us amateurs. Um, we're not good out of the bunkers, and avoiding them, you know, is typically. A, a very good uh, path of action. You know, PGA Tour players. You know, you'll hear on TV. Um, you know, the PGA Tour players and the LPG, LPGA Tour players. You know, they're trying to get into the bunker in certain situations, and in certain situations, that tr- that's true. And depending on the green complex and the grass around the green, they're probably better off in a bunker. But that does not hold for for the rest of us, for us mere mortals. Um, so avoiding that's really important, especially especially when there's on a on a fairway bunker when there's a steep face where you're going to be challenged to get the ball out. Um, and then around the green, um, one of the things that uh, the players that I work with that I that I have them pay attention to is the elevation change between the surface of the green and the area around it. And so the deeper the bunker. Um, and this is, you know, all, all logical stuff. You know, we didn't, you know, create anything new here. We didn't invent the wheel. But the deeper the bunker, the more elevation change between the bunker and the surface of the green, the harder the shot gets. And that's true for the, the rough surrounding the green as well. So when you have a green elevated three feet, four feet, five feet, the, the more the elevation change, the harder the shot gets. Uh, the inflection point is about two feet. Uh, so if there's more than a two foot difference, it starts to get harder. And then the, the more the difference, the harder it gets. And you know this doesn't apply too much, but the same holds true if the green is below um, the surrounding area. So sometimes you have these punch bowl type greens where the sides are a little bit higher or the bunkers a little bit elevated. Um, if there's more than two feet of elevation change, those shots get harder too. So um, to back to your original question, we, we want to avoid bunkers. We want to shift away from bunkers as much as we can as amateur players. Yeah. I mean, and no one has ever come into the clubhouse after a golf round saying they were in every bunker today and they had a great round. <laughs> that has yet to happen. No, uh, that does oh. not happen. All right. Let's talk about wedges. Cause one of the things that I, I like that you talk about regularly is expectations on wedge shots. And so maybe under, I don't know if you consider it under a hundred yards or under 60 yards. Sometimes when we have a wedge in our hand approaching a green, we have very high expectations to hit it right next to the pin. So what is, what's going on? Like what are good players hitting, you know, their proximity to the hole when they have a wedge in hand, what should we be happy with as an amateur golfer, whether it's a scratch golfer or a 10 handicap, what do you, what's, what do you have for us? You know, this is this is definitely always a hot topic, um, and it's one that um, I think some folks um, uh, they they push back on a bit. Um, they they think that every wedge should be inside of of ten feet, and that's just simply it's just simply not how it works. It's just not the case. I wish I had LPGA data for this. Um, you know, the LPGA recently started. You know, tracking strokes gained, um, but it, it's not. I don't have access to it, so I wish I could give you LPGA numbers on this. But tour pros, uh, PGA tour pros, their average proximity from 100 yards in the fairway is 18 and a half feet. Which that's wild. Um, they're not. 
Yeah, it's 18 and a half feet. You know, that, that's uh, so if you gave them a, a 37 foot circle, um, you know, that's the average proximity, you know, you know, 18 and a half feet in either direction of the hole. Um, and they're only hitting about 25 percent of their shots inside of 10 feet. Um, that's amazing. Like, that's really, really good. But for a 10 handicap to, to stand out there at 80, 90, 100 yards and expect to hit a high percentage of their shots inside of, you know, 20 feet, much less 10 feet is completely unrealistic. How far do you hit the ball? I, uh, I mean, between like 240 to 250 is a good, good ball for me. Yeah. Like you are in the very, very upper percentile of not only index, right? So you're in the top 1% of, of golfers. Um, I forget exactly what it is, but it, it's you're in the top 1% of golfers as a scratch player. And you are also in the, the top 1% distance wise. Yeah. Um, there is such a huge relationship between your index and how far you hit the golf ball. And there's some amazing programs out there for distance. I'm not sure if you've ever had any of the, you know, the distance program folks on here, but you can gain a lot of distance. It doesn't matter who you are going through some of these programs and it's so worth it. Every 10 yards of distance you gain, depending on the player, it will be worth anywhere from a shot to a shot and a half per round. Um, in lowering your scores. So if you're somebody that's hitting at 160 and you go to hitting at 200, you're going to gain anywhere from four to six shots yeah. just by hitting the golf ball longer. And in, in a and a lot of people will gain even more than that. So if it sounds like I'm stressing distance a whole lot. It's because it's so important and it is one of the very easy ways to lower your score. Yeah. And I mean, you, you hopped right up to, you know, gaining 40 yards. It, like you said, even 10 yards will make a, will make a, a valid difference. And trust yeah. me, wouldn't you rather be hitting in at 140 instead of 150 or a hundred yeah. instead of 110? I mean, just those clubs, it's so much easier. So. It is. It's so much easier. I gained a lot of distance a couple of years ago. I was swinging driver about 99 um, and I got really focused on um, fitness um, and speed training. And I, I took my uh, uh, speed with driver up to about 113, 114 um, and gained just an enormous amount of distance. And, and it took me about five months to get there. Yeah. Um, so you can see results really, really quickly. Um, and uh, definitely I'd look into it if, if you haven't looked into it. Absolutely. Not you, but uh, you're, you're, you're in the top percent. I want to be where you are. So you're in the top percentile. So I want to go back to, I, I remembered what I wanted to say. You had a tweet once that said, making net par is a solid goal. And again, par is an amazing score. And same net par is an amazing score because really, if you're making net par more times than not, your handicap is going down. So absolutely. Um, no question. Yeah. So the way the handicap system is is set up, you know, you all, and this applies to everybody, you will only beat your handicap. So shoot, you know, net par, or net under par about 20% of the time. So if you went out and you played a round of golf and you had net par, on every single hole, um, that round of golf, the score that you have that day would be in the top 20% of all your scores. Now, do we want to make some pars on, on holes where we get a stroke? Sure. Absolutely. Um, but you know, net par is a, is a, is a, is a good outcome. Um, I would, I always caution people to not focus on outcomes. And so I, I use, you know, net par as a good goal. Um, as something you think about after the fact, and you don't stand on a tee box with a score in mind, I think that can be detrimental. Standing on a tee box with a score in mind, now it can help you to you know potentially shift how you approach a hole, uh, which is okay. But you know, but standing on a hole saying I need to make a five this hole, probably not a good way to to start thinking about a hole. So my number in my head is forty feet. Like if a putt is over forty feet long, it's getting a two putt is really good at that point. But you're saying even from 20 feet out is considered a really good two putt. Scratch players average two putts from 28 feet. 
Wow. So for, yeah, for you, to, PGA tour players. So I'm going to, I'm going to pick on you a bit here. PGA yeah. tour players, um, they average two putts from about 33 feet. Wow. Um, and so having 40 foot as your, as your mark is, you know, it's completely, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but it's completely oh. unrealistic. Yeah. Um, wow. it, what, is it, do we want a two putt from 40 feet? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but you're, you're going to average over two putts from 40 feet. So, you know, your inflection point is about 28 feet as a scratch player. And you're going to average about two, or the typical uh, scratch player is going to average about two putts from there. So now if you're slightly better, um, you said you're a really good putter, you know, you might, you know, average two putts from 32 feet, 33 feet, somewhere in there. You know, there are some scratch players that, you know, that putt better than professionals. Um, but they're the unicorn, like they're few and far between, we, you know, we have a lot of people in the Arcos database and I can look at their numbers and we have just a, a small handful that are, you know, putting over a long period of time, like at tour quality. Yeah. So 28 feet for you is two putts. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So, um, to finish up the putting conversation, is there any data behind three putting? When you eliminate the majority of three putts, you know, you get significantly better as far as scoring and handicap or or not really. You're it's more a distance thing. Um, so this is why this is one of the reasons why it's so important to track your stats. I've said this you know, three or four times already. And your listeners are probably annoyed at me saying it, but no, it's I so important. It. And here's why. So we can have um the Two ten handicap players standing next to each other, and one. And if I were to look at of all the ten handicap players, if I were to look at the best five percent putters, remember their their overall handicaps at ten, but they're in the top five percent of putters for ten handicaps. They would putt like the typical scratch player. They would be as good a putter as the typical scratch player. Now, if I took the other ten handicap player that's standing next to them. They're the bottom 5% putters. Again, bottom 5% of all the 10 handicap players. They putt about the same as a 20 index player. So you could have two players. Both are overall 10 indexes. They're both 10 handicaps. You step on the first tee, what's your, what's your handicap? I'm a 10. I'm a 10 too. Cool. You could have two 10 handicaps and one of them putts like a scratch player. The other putts like a 20 which is why it's so important to know where you fit in that. Now, if I were coaching both of those players, there's one of those players where we are going to spend almost no time on putting like mm -hmm. that. We're going to do maintenance. That's yeah. all we're doing there. We're just going to try to keep it sharp. The other one needs a ton of work on putting. And so knowing where you fall, um, is extremely important and will give you and your coach the information that you need to know where you need to focus. And driving down, you know, three putts is what you were talking about for high, mid to higher handicap players is extremely important. Uh, they have way, way, way more three putts than, you know, a scratch player would have. And, and most of that's going to be accomplished by good speed control. But knowing where you where you stand on each one of these categories so whether it's your driver your irons your short game or your putter you know tracking your stats and i'm part of arcos be awesome if you used it but i don't care if you use the back of the napkin if you're trying to get better you need to know these numbers because yeah. they're going to make such a big impact on how you can focus your time to improve yeah absolutely all right so we got to finish things up but i can't not ask about tournament golf because again this is one of your one of your recent tweets where you mentioned you know something along the lines of tournament golf is much different than regular golf what do you have to say about tournament golf yeah tournament golf is a very different animal um and so i think there's a few different kinds of golf i think there's casual golf with your friends which is a blast um, i play a ton of that i think there's competitive golf where you're either maybe competing with your friends um, and maybe there's a few dollars on the line or you're playing in something else that's relatively competitive, maybe like a league night or something like that. And then there's tournament golf. And, and I would classify tournament golf as, you know, some big event at your club or club championship, local events, state events, national events. Um, and then the, you know, kind of the, 
even above that is tournament golf as a professional where, you know, if you go out and you try to qualify for the, you know, for the, the, the U S women's am, and you know, you don't, you don't qualify, you know, you're still, you're going to feed your family that night. Right. Well, when you're, when you're playing for a paycheck um, and you don't win um, and you don't make money that that's a very, very different beast than, than what we're going through. So there's different levels. And for those that want to compete and play tournament golf, um, I encourage you to start playing as many tournaments as you can get into everything that you can get into play as often as you can. You're going to feel a lot of different things playing tournament golf than you will anything else. And the more reps you can get under your belt, the better off you're going to be for it, for sure. 